So we have another email from one of my subscribers. And you guys are sending in great questions and I appreciate it. Now the email reads, hi, I was talking to someone, some people online and the lady asked me, asked me these questions. She said, if Jesus died for our sins, why does he, why does hell still exist? Why are we punished for sin if the price was supposedly already paid? Why did Jesus have to die in the tormenting way that he did? And if not believing is the, the greatest sin of all, does that mean that a person who preached and practiced peace, love, gratefulness, and unity throughout their life without going to church, reading the Bible, and believing and believing in the biblical God, will they go to hell before the person who is a believer, yet knowingly commits sins of all kinds every single day? Um, so let's look at the first thing this woman asked. I'm not going to touch on everything, but just the key points, the first key points. She says, if Jesus died for our sins, why does hell still exist? Why are we punished for sin if the price was supposedly already paid? Well, the problem that she has is, which is why she even asked the question to begin with, is because she holds to an erroneous view of salvation that is universal. In her eyes, the be she believes everyone is going to heaven because Jesus died. It's this whole, I call it the, the blood heresy, the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus. We are saved. He shed his blood. Um, you find a lot of this in the Pentecostal churches, Church of Christ churches. This view that because Jesus Christ shed his blood, all sinners are forgiven. Now, what people need to understand is that Jesus becoming a propitiation for our sins by appeasing the Father's wrath does not exclude the sinner of their own personal responsibility in actively seeking Christ by way of repentance and faith. Now, the second question she asks is, why are we punished for sin if the price has already been paid? Uh, the ones that are punished for all eternity are the ones that actively refused to come to Christ on his terms. They died in their sins because they refused to take the free gift of eternal life. It's their fault. Fault lies with the sinner. Um, and the final thing that she asks is, why did Jesus have to die in a tormenting way that he did? Well, the first thing we have to come to grips with is to acknowledge that his ways are not our ways. Speaking of the Lord, his thoughts are not our thoughts. They are higher than ours. Isaiah 55, 8, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. So why did Jesus have to die in the way that he did? For two reasons. One, because the promise of redemption required an innocent death. This is why Jesus this is why Jesus came not just to die, but to first fulfill the law of God by never breaking it. And the second reason he had to die, because sin cannot go unpunished. And if the elect are going to be sinless on a day of judgment, it's only because someone first paid the price. And that was Jesus. Now, he died for you. Are you going to let this free gift slip away? I'm not, but I'm not you. So you need to make a decision and you need to tackle these questions seriously and not impose your own personal opinions on it, but to take the word at what it says. When people say, no, our, our problem is this, our problem is that, we say, no, 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 our problem is that God created the world and God created man and he put man in the garden to keep the garden and he gave the man a command. And he held that man to perfect, perpetual obedience to that command. And he promised him life if he kept it and death if he didn't. And he didn't keep it. He ate. And because he ate, because of that one man, sin entered the world. And death through sin. And everyone born from that man through ordinary generation inherited that man's sin nature. And because of that sin nature, sins proceed from it. And our world is broken because of that sin. And we stand guilty before a holy and righteous God. And we know that he's holy and we know that he's righteous and we crave justice. But the problem is that if God gives us justice, we all die. And so that God in his goodness and in his mercy sent forth his son, who was not born of ordinary generation, but was born of a virgin. Yes, the virgin birth matters. Why? Because if he's born of ordinary generation, he's born in sin. But because he's not born of ordinary generation, he's not born in sin. He's clean of sin. His record is clean. And he keeps his record clean. And he obeys God's law. And because he's fully God and fully man, he obeys the law of God on our behalf in his active obedience. And then in his passive obedience, God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. All we like sheep had gone astray. 
Each of us had turned to his own way, but God laid upon him the iniquity of us all. And Christ died for sin once for all, the just for the unjust. And God imputes our sinfulness to him. And he nails our sinfulness to the tree. And Christ dies and raises again on the third day for our justification. And there's another imputation. The righteousness of Christ is actually imputed to us so that God can be both just and the justifier of the one who places faith in Jesus Christ so that all those who come to Christ may enter in, so that all those who place faith in Christ might be saved, but not only saved, but sanctified. Because he's the firstborn of many brethren. We're justified and we're adopted into the family of God. And we're sanctified. And as his children, we begin to bear the family resemblance. And we're further sanctified throughout this life by the very same gospel that saves us until one day when it's all said and done, we're not just saved from the penalty of sin. We're not just saved from the power of sin, but one day we're glorified and saved from the very presence of sin. That's the gospel that we preach. That's the gospel that we need. And that's the gospel that's more than enough.